So now I'm going to show a few case studies from 2014. Um, I believe that there's only one other person in this room who is at the 2014 awards in San Francisco, which is Turi, sitting over there, who's one of our 2014 judges. So hopefully this will be new for most people in the room. Um, and I'm going to show you four submissions. Um, over the years, we've kind of looked at all the submissions to figure out what submissions, um, what kind of categories of submissions are there. Um, and basically, um, we've, we've come up with a few categories that basically represent almost any submission we've received. So the first is a brand new type of technology, um, something that in particular has a different model of user interaction, or HCI. Uh, we also see um, really complex data sets, right? Like when Morgan Stanley won, or um, SAP, so enterprise software that deals with a lot of data, financial data, et cetera. Um, that tends to be a big category because UX is very important. Um, category game changers. So uh, Google has won um, top awards for several years. And each time they submit something that has really been a game changer in the industry, like Google Now or the Android operating system. And obviously, that's not something that most of us are able to submit. But um, it certainly has a big impact on user experience and our industry. Um, Many submissions represent simple and elegant solutions to really complex problems, including service design problems, which are multi-platform, multi-scenario. Um, ZocDoc was a great example of that. Executes common technology like e-commerce or websites that is fairly well understood really well. Um, we had several submissions for this year that fell into this category, like Virgin and VW, which are quote unquote websites, but they're really awesome websites. Uh, having a compelling and cohesive narrative is incredibly important. Uh, and there were several submissions this year that followed that. Um, one of our 2011 winners, uh, Scott is here, and he submitted um, a concept product that didn't even launch. And Method Money was the same. Uh, Method Money was a theoretical product. So you can even submit concept work, like student work, for example, that hasn't actually launched. And if you're telling a great narrative and you're explaining why the UX is great, and you're showing how you did the research and what processes and steps you went through and how it's solving a problem, it's still an awesome submission. And most importantly, everyone that won always showed outstanding UX processes and best practices. So that's the most important of all. So here's SwiftKey. Uh, SwiftKey won uh, honorable mention. I'm going to show four um, submissions from uh, 2014. SwiftKey 5 introduces emoji prediction. More than 800 emoji and the SwiftKey store with more than 30 new keyboard themes. We even added an optional number row, a frequently requested feature. SwiftKey also happens to be free. SwiftKey enables users to type in multiple languages simultaneously, with no need to switch keyboard layouts which has resulted in a very international audience. More than a quarter of our users are multilingual. Top combinations of languages are English with German, English with Spanish, and English with Portuguese. SwiftKey users all obviously use smartphones or tablets, and many use both. The average number of devices per user is 1.5. We started with personas, who are the actors in scenarios, flow diagrams, and user journeys. We created wireframes and interactive prototypes to illustrate our designs, with usability tests of migrations of existing users to SwiftKey 5, the typing experience, keyboard theme discovery, purchase, and installation, which resulted in iterations throughout the design and development cycle. SwiftKey technology is found on more than 200 million devices, the keyboard has been a number one bestseller on Google Play in 58 countries to date.
50 users have written more than 4.5 trillion characters. They have saved more than a trillion keystrokes with Swifties technology. We estimate that more than 16,000 years worth of typing time has been saved. So, um, which of the best practices did you see in that submission? Anyone? What? They showed their work. They showed the UX process. They showed personas and wireframes and testing, um, the entire process end to end. What else? They showed that it was cross-platform, so it was a complex product. It wasn't just one um, device or one scenario. It's multi-language. What else? The video had a cohesive narrative. We were able to follow it from start to finish. It very clearly articulated why it should win a UX award and what was awesome about its UX in specific. What else? It had some data points. It showed how the product was successful and impactful. So at the end, we saw the customer adoption that was a direct correlation to the UX of the product. What else? Well, one thing that stood out to me is they identified their audience. So they mentioned that their audience is international, they're multilingual, they need different kinds of keyboards. So they were, and of course, they want something that's fast and that they can do with one hand while they're on the go. So they identified the audience and the audience needs that they were trying to solve with the problem. Anything else that stood out to anybody? Yes. Exactly, they listened to users and they got feedback. So this was a great submission. You can see this wasn't gonna win a Webby or um, a Can or anything else. It's not a product demo. You're not gonna go find this on their website. It's about UX specifically. So we can look at gold now. I've got um, SAP Consumer Insights. Uh, they won gold for best enterprise experience. And uh, same thing, they followed pretty much all of the best practices. In the beginning of the project, when we started to learn what, kind, what, is, what is the data that we have in our hand, it was a little bit overwhelming to, you know, to see how you have over a billion records coming from those phone providers, from those uh, cell phone providers. Uh, and really how can we use that data and how can we make uh, meaningful insights for the media planners. We interviewed market analysts to understand what they do, their goals, the challenges and how we can make it better. We realized they want to find the consumer patterns from the meaningful visualization in the massive amount of data. Two keywords that we focused on through the design process were flexibility and constraint. For example, Time and location are the most common elements for all use cases. We use them as the constraints and the starting point to create an analytic report. Consumer Insight 365 gathers and aggregates 14 billion anonymized telecom data points per day into easy to understand visualizations that allow a company to see consumer trends. Marketing professionals can now analyze consumer profiles and behavior. You can compare and combine dimensions instantly. The partnerships that we developed with the uh, development team and the product management team really, really showed through the product because it was really important for us to understand some of their hesitation and why they don't want to do certain things and try to uh, negotiate on things that were important for us as user experience designers. Uh, and it, I think it's really showed in the end product because they, there is not much gap between what's designed and what is built. 
and I think that's that a, a good testimonial for the for the good partnership we have with them. So you can see the narrative flow is different there. Um, but what points did you did you notice? We saw them doing research, quite a lot of user research, and they talked to that point, uh, the amount of research that we, they did with their target audience, which in this case was specific enterprise customers of SAP. What else? They negotiated with the stakeholders, so they took the entire case study with the perspective of UX professionals working uh, within an integrated team, and what was their contribution to the team, um, what negotiations did they get, did they make with both the um, clients as well as the other product uh, and technical stakeholders to make sure that user experience was at the center of the end product. What else? Yeah, the, um, the, so the, the point that was made is that um, the actual product here was, was took a little bit of a backseat to the process, um, and it was more of a behind the scenes. And um, I think that's an interesting um, thing to notice about the submissions for the awards is that they're not all the same. So some of them are focusing more on the product and then great UX of the product, and then they do a little bit of a glimpse of undercover or what it took, and other ones are much more on the process and the people and the steps and then there's only a little bit of uh, what was the outcome um, and partly it depends frankly on the level of sensitivity of the product so um, sometimes uh, like with SAP there's a lot of legal regulations that they have to deal with um, so I would imagine that um, part of the reason we didn't see more of the product is they were actually constrained in terms of what they could show um, and the first year, Morgan Stanley won the, um, the grand prize, and um, we had actually very limited visibility into the product. We had to basically go off some marketing materials that described it, as well as an emphasis on the process, uh, for the same reason. So you see some variability. Any other comments about that submission? Okie dokie. So third out of fourth. Uh, VW, uh, best brand experience. When Deutsche LA and Volkswagen set out to redesign VW.com for the U.S., we knew this had to be more than a redesign. We wanted to reinvent the way people shop for cars online. Our big idea is, it's like a dating site, except it's for cars. After all, online dating is about finding someone you want to love in your area, which is like shopping for cars. Where you want to love the car? Then find the car. Because car shopping in the U.S. is all about local inventory. Today's automaker websites typically accomplish these steps with two separate tools that don't talk to each other, a builder and an inventory search tool. We took on the challenge of making it one seamless, powerful tool that would get shoppers to real cars in their area faster. And that's what Find a Match is. It's a filter tool that lets you shop non-linearly. So let's say you're looking for a red car with a sunroof. You may not know the VW model lineup, but these are the two most important things to you. With Find a Match, it's easy. We abstracted car features so that you can find the cars the way that people shop in dealerships, instead of forcing them to understand our model and trim structure. Even with just these two selections, you can look at inventory. These are cars at dealerships in your area that have a sunroof and come in red. Each of these tiles show the car is configured, so the color, wheels, even the interior are correct. No second guessing. When you select one of these results, you get a profile page, just like on a dating site. Except it's better, because all the information on this page is true. From the imagery, to the specs, to which dealership the car is located. Tools that are normally hidden in separate sections of the site are now where they make the most sense, like a payment estimator. You can also save individual cars to your favorites. And all this functionality is wrapped in a streamlined design and structure that contains everything you would expect from a car site, in a way that makes sense to car shoppers.
So that one you can see was actually the opposite. It was all about the product, and then right at the end they showed a little bit of their process. Um, what were some other um, notables of our best practices that people saw in this one? They stated the points of the exercise. So why did they do what they did? What was the reason and the outcome? What else? They, they identified the audience, which is obviously online car browsers and shoppers, um, up front, and what the user's needs were in this particular case. So um, what do people want to do when they're trying to browse or shop for a car online? Uh, how do people go about it? And what are their needs? And why is this a superior solution than the other solutions out in the market, which historically have to force you into finding things by model? rather than by um, component or feature that you're most interested in. What else? Well, at the end, they showed a little bit about their process, including the fact that they did wireframes and testing. Uh, and clearly, uh, the emphasis in this case was on uh, a very usable uh, simple product. So to some degree this is also service design because it was integrating uh, the manufacturing process in with the e-commerce uh, and web marketing process into one integrated whole, which um, for a company like VW is, is no small feat. Uh, I've got um, one last case study and then we're going to move on uh, to the panel. So uh, this is Muse, the brain sensing headband. This is kind of like a wild card from 2014, one silver. We make brain sensing technologies that help people be healthier, happier, and more connected in their daily lives. That's why we created Muse, the brain sensing headband, which trains you to calm and settle your mind. Hailed by VentureBee as the most important wearable of 2014, our human-centered design strategy targeted three main problems help people understand the technology, teach people to fit their headband and get good signal, create an engaging and rewarding user experience. First, we had to help people understand the technology. People don't even know this technology is possible or understand their mind as a thing that can be measured. We needed to help them construct a mental model which represented their brain, their mind, an algorithm providing audio feedback, the brain sensing headbands, and how these parts can interact to improve their life. We identified metaphor as the best way to understand the system using simple, familiar principles. To find the right metaphor, we facilitated affinity diagram and brain writing exercises. We conducted charrettes to explore how each metaphor would map to the system and eventually landed on the concept of weather, with calm wind representing a calm mind and turbulent winds representing an active mind. When asked, almost 100% of our participants described the metaphor as matching the product experience, using words like natural, appropriate and effective. The second problem we faced lay in teaching users how to fit their headband and get good signal. The Muse headband is a very sensitive instrument. Muscle noise, makeup, hair, or even eye movements can interrupt the signal. To solve this, we built wireframes and low fidelity prototypes of the session flow. Every two weeks, we ran lean UX sprints with six professionally recruited users in our target psychographics. With each iteration, we use the data to Craft language that mirrors users' natural understanding of the system. Design a real-time indicator tuned to maximize signal quality while minimizing frustration. And develop a tutorial that turns novice users into competent EEG technicians capable of administering neurofeedback without even realizing it. The resulting flow allowed more than 90% of users to get good signal with no assistance on their first try. This meant we could finally begin creating an engaging and rewarding user experience which fits into daily life. In parallel with our sprints, we sent the product home with participants for weeks at a time to help us design, test, and implement gamification and data visualization elements to increase motivation. A year later, we have analyzed UX data from 134 participants engaging with 62 product iterations in 21 user studies. We've just started shipping and are thrilled with the positive response from journalists and our first users. It was calming, simple, and easy to use. You've done a good job of making things emotional rather than overly cerebral. 
Muse is the first consumer-ready brain-sensing technology that's usable, easy to understand, rewarding, and makes people healthier, happier, and more connected. I love this one because uh, it, you know it's it's all about the UX process um, and in building something that is not something that most of us have ever done, which is um, doing a UX for your brain waves, um, designing an interaction for that. Um, what do people notice about this submission in terms of best practices? They really spelled out the process extensively, all the different steps they took, when they did it, where, how, they showed personas, they had charrettes, they did mind mapping, they created UX principles, uh, they did many iterations of prototypes and wireframes, tons of testing, repeat testing, iterations in the product from testing. What else? Okay, well, <laughs> um, there were several things there. I mean, they defined what the need was that they were trying to solve, um, which was really uh, people who uh, want to um, calm their mind in meditation um, using this product. Um, and they, uh, they showed exactly which best practices that they were um, applying and the impact. So all about how um, they've gotten all this um, traction and early sales uh, that came from a very well-designed product in a completely uncharted territory. So just a quick recap. Um, the key things that make a winning case study are you do identify your user and their needs, you solve that problem, um, you have a well-designed intuitive and usable product with a great UX processes um, which incorporate best practices including user research and testing. Your case study follows a coherent and compelling narrative. And if you're lucky, you might also have an impressive product and newer and advanced technology like Muse um, or great impact or an adoption um, like SwiftKey. But you saw from um, a couple of these case studies even uh, that um, you could have a quote unquote website and still make um, an award winning um, submission. Um, Virgin won the grand prize for um, the Virgin America um, website uh, for booking online. So product, process, and story. So uh, before we move on to any judges and winners, uh, any um, questions about the awards or anything like that? Yes. Yes, if you go to the UX Awards website and you go into um, past years, you can see every single submission. Well, every year it's gone up dramatically. Um, last year we had a couple hundred. How often do, so Matt's point, just in case you weren't able to hear, uh, was that um, does, does having an access to the actual product as a judge impact your likelihood of getting an award? Um, and I would, there is a natural tendency, of course, I think, for any judge to have um, an affinity for things that they can understand. So for example, with, with Virgin, um, anybody who's ever booked a plane ticket online, which is probably all of us, uh, has experienced what that's like. So, of course, that has an uh, Im impact on the person's ability to um, evaluate um, the outcome because they have firsthand experience with it. But in terms of actually trying out different products, um, we can ask um, the judges in the room. Uh, my perception over the past couple of years is that most judges don't have um, time to actually try out different products, and we should be looking at the case study. The case study should tell us who is the audience, what is their problem, how did we solve that problem, why was it an effective solution. So that should be encapsulated in the case study, and if it's not and we have to go try out the product, then in essence, it wasn't a very good case study. 
Other questions before we move on to the panel? 